go. So thank you very much. Um, before I jump straight into the Holocene, uh, the middle Holocene elm decline, and start talking about trees, I just want to give a background to the project which my uh, PhD is integrated into, what I, I'm supposed to be doing for my PhD research, and then this pseudo research that I'm doing at the moment looking at the mid Holocene elm decline. So my PhD is integrated into uh, York Class Frontiers project, which uh, endeavours to create a new research paradigm uh, in order to uh, research now submerged paleo landscapes. And our specific uh, research area is looking at the North Sea, so some of you might have heard of Doggerland, um, the, I suppose they call it a land bridge, but it's not really a land bridge, it's more of a land mass, or a country that uh, connected uh, the UK to mainland Europe um, up to about 7,500 years ago until when it's postulated that it was completely undated. So how we're going about actually uh, reconstructing this landscape is using a few different techniques. So firstly, uh, seismic mapping. A few years ago, uh, the pilot study for this project, uh, the North Sea Paleo Landscape, um, essentially identified a new technique in order for us to identify these actual paleo landscapes uh, within the sediments instead of just using traditional bathymetric data as the actual landmass from that time. You can take time slices from seismic data taken from companies who are specifically looking for uh, well, petroleum deposits. We can get the actual top. 10, well, five metres um, of their data and actually cut through the sediment to identify the actual river channels uh, below uh, within the sediment. So you can kind of see some of the channels here. Uh, the resolution's not great. And then uh, further up again, it actually 3D seismic data. So we can actually identify these river channels and now we can, from that, we have optimised uh, coring locations uh, within the North Sea. So we've actually optimised where we can actually get uh, datable material and actual uh, paleo-environmental uh, material that we can... Uh, corroborate and date and actually construct uh, the history um, of this landscape as it's changing and, and as it's being inundated. And coupled with that, we're also using SETA DNA to actually um, pretty much profile what the actual species were, or what the niches were as well uh, within these sediments uh, using the uh, XRF data as well. And against the uh, actual dating methods, we should be able to pretty much uh, construct quite a good timeline of how that uh, environment and what the niches were and how they were changing until it's uh, final inundation. So my PhD research is integrated into the actual computer modelling and simulation uh, aspect um, of the project which is kind of going to come in the next few months when we're actually starting because we're a five year project so going into the last two years now so that's when the computer modelling simulation kind of starts. We're going to be using primarily agent based modelling techniques and our goal is to essentially create large-scale ABMs in 100,000 kilometer squared areas at high resolution um, and produce uh, data that can be visualized in a means that the public can see and interact with and understand how we go about uh, processing this data uh, at such a large scale. And obviously not just uh, actual graphical representations but also um, more immersive technologies. So we constructed an augmented reality sandbox um, as well and this essentially uses uh, connect sensors, uh, gets the height of the sand, you can change the height of the sand and then it populates the uh, projected image on the sand depending on the height of the sand uh, to create different niches depending on what the altitudes are for those niches and we can actually simulate agents running around this, uh, interacting with landscape hunting, foraging and see how the landscape develops and changes. Uh, in order to create these large scale uh, ABMs, uh, the plan is to use um, GPGPU uh, processing uh, uh, utilizing primarily uh, graphics card processing units, uh, cross parallelization, uh, faster processing power than CPUs. Don't ask me too much later about this because I'm not a computer scientist and our computer scientist has come up with this way of that we're actually going to be able to do this. Uh, also using octree and uh, quadtree um, architectures so that we can, within the simulation space, um, identify uh, zone eight areas in the landscape where more processing power is needed because more things are happening. Um, and again, this will speed up then the process for us to build these uh, large scale ABMs. My PhD research, um, my background is primarily in um, Mesolithic uh, cultural archaeology and also experimental archaeology. So I've been brought on to essentially build scenarios of how Mesolithic content gatherers and potentially early uh, Neolithic uh, cultures would have been interacting with this landscape. Um, and kind of got a little bit off, off topic uh, the last few months, um, kind of building uh, kind of the early stages of the uh, niche and woodland dynamics that will be implemented in large scale ABMs by looking at kind of a case study from archaeology. 
I'm, I'm, I should know about. I'm, it's a case of we're not trying to find the the Holocene or the Mid Holocene on the climb in the North Sea. It's just a good case study in an archaeological context, but we don't know exactly uh, how this uh, process actually came about because we postulate that it could have been a case of whether it was disease, uh, human impact, because it, it co coincides with the actual uh, neolithization um, of Northwestern Europe. Um, and also the um, Dutch elm disease as well that happened in the 70s. Some people say maybe something similar to that, or it could just be a uh, climate or environmental. So the actual um, change is quite a broad date range. Um, just looking at it in the context of Northwest Europe as a whole, uh, primarily people probably recent uh, thought it was more kind of a pretty steady uh, kind of flow movement. It was quite synchronous, essentially the event. But now new research actually suggests that it's not it's completely asynchronous. So even at uh, regional scales between sites that could be hundreds of meters apart, the, the date ranges could be hundreds or two hundreds, you know, of years in between any decline. So there's something not quite right in the context of the uh, palynological uh, studies that we've done today, we're looking at actual pollen counts uh, within the cores. So my study area so, well, will potentially scale up to the whole of Yorkshire um, because it came as a discussion with one of our uh, palynologists on the project. It was quite interesting because he does uh, elm decline studies and want just to see essentially can we actually have more insight into how this process actually occurs. So the model it itself is I've kind of stolen part components from another modeling technique, um, uh, constructing forest gap models of contemporary uh, uh, contemporary woodlands and forests. So essentially, these initially were uh, stands um, that could be 10, 10 by 10 meters squared, and they populated those computationally with trees which were not spatially aware with each other, but they could interact with each other. Um, in terms of their uh, size and scale. Obviously these developed further where there was actual uh, interactions between neighbouring patches. So it's very much kind of embedded in um, complexity science, uh, or ABMs or cellular automata. Uh, so there's kind of some parallels between them. And some of the more uh, recent uh, cat models have become quite advanced and so that they are very similar to uh, agent-based modelling techniques. So the model, uh, that I've been doing, I finally got onto it, um, is essentially modeling a simulation space of around one hectare uh, populated with different uh, woodland species or different tree species and simulating their effect on how they interact with each other. Um, it says here one tick is equal to one month in simulation space currently, but I've changed that to a year um, for the moment. Um, so hopefully it'll be a case of scaling up potentially using patch based dynamics. For the larger scale environment, uh, patch interactions of the local scale, but it'll probably be a case of we'll just pretty much do local scale in a large landscape with the uh, distributed uh, simulation processing we'll do later on. So at the moment, the model itself has uh, been built in NetLogo. Well, the, what has been done so far is being built in NetLogo. Um, so from forest gap models that have been produced, they have the specific sub models or sub processes within them as well. Uh, primarily recruitment, uh, mortality, um, establishment of new trees, um, and these are all hindered by environmental inputs and also uh, competition between neighbouring trees. So the general growth function, this is pretty much goes over my head sometimes, is essentially reduced by a proportional constant that s assumes that the tree will reach its uh, half of its maximum diameter by a certain age, and this is species specific, so that the growth curve is per species, how their stem diameter relates to their height is consistent, so that we can actually model behavior between the trees uh, who have similar uh, growth uh, patterns. And then that is then reduced by environmental scalars uh, per individual. Uh, environmental input I've been using so far, again I'm using Met Office data as well, just like Carol was, um, primarily from weather stations. Uh, pick five so far, especially associated with altitude, because at the moment the main driver for the environmental impact is uh, using degree uh, days, um, specifically from the uh, TMAX and team in the precipitation and frost days aren't really coming to it at the moment. So it's quite interesting to see with obviously at higher altitudes, different species will uh, react differently to. Uh, specific degree going rays and temperature. And this can be corroborated against uh, other contemporary studies which have used 
similar species. Obviously, these are non-analogous environments in the past, so there's no way of actually knowing whether this would have been accurate for species from the past. So the uh, maximum age there, maximum stem or trunk diameter, I suppose you would really say they can reach other maximum height, or what the um, the maximum and minimum degree growing days that they can uh, uh, attain growth in. Uh, environmental scalars essentially at the moment it's just the degree don't growing days. Degree uh, growing days essentially takes uh, the average temperature per day and multiplies it by the amount of days in a month. Uh, and then this is reduced further again by the fact that um, the simulation is annually so that uh, it works in a, uh, based on a parabola relationship annually. This is not a parabola, by the way, to the right. That um, the, the the minimum, or the the T max uh, temperature in January will be the lowest T max in a year, and the T max in July will be the highest in the year. So it works in a parabola effect in order to simulate it within uh, a year uh, space. That's why potentially, when it comes to monthly, we can do it monthly, and it might be slightly more accurate. And in terms of the degree growing days per species, uh, it's reduced by how it falls either side of its optimal. So the optimal will be between its, its minimum degree days that it can grow in and its maximum degree days that it can grow in. So if it was reduced, this is probably... So if this species has, I don't know, 2,800, is their optimal degree growing days, but the degree growing days for that year average was 4,000, we'll say, then it reduces it by 0.5. So that's the, the optimal being reduced by the environmental uh, factor. And then that's all species based and actual individuals based. Recruitment and establishment, um, 20 new species per tick uh, within the hectare space because that's what a lot of the original forest gap models postulate that that's how many species can be re introduced into uh, that area. Um, then recruitment is based off of the degree growing days again, uh, the temperature effect uh, reduced by how many uh, of each species is in the space and which side of the optimal degree growing days that it can grow against. Um, and then it runs through a basic trip to net logo to identify which species are recruited based on a random uh, generator uh, over, uh, well, cycles through it 20 times, essentially. And then, and then it places the new sapling in a dispersal kernel um, of, depending on the tree's height, it has an actual radius in which the seedlings can disperse. It's quite crude in the manner of the fact that that's probably not really how a dispersal kernel uh, would reach. Um, obviously, it's dependent on wind and things like that as well, but it just, just gets quite overcomplicated trying to do that in an age based model. And then, again, competition for light and space in terms of neighbouring trees. And then these are reduced again by... Um, EIVs, Ellenberg Indicator Values. Um, these are um, not quantitative, but qualitative um, assessments of species, variables of how they can uh, grow, essentially, with a specific parameter. So for this, it's the EIV, which is how light affects them. So one could be they're completely shade tolerant, and 10 is they, it's essentially the complete opposite. And I've just kind of reduced these slightly uh, in order to just to reduce the uh, growth uh, in terms of competition effects. Mortality, um, very simple again. Um, essentially, if there's too many trees on one patch, patch is a meter by meter. If the stem diameter of a tree is greater than one meter, naturally, it will take priority in that patch. And then if the growth increment, if their optimal growth increment is less than the reduced real uh, increment or growth increment i.e. that's been reduced by the uh, temperature days then they will pick a random tree within a specific range and kill it. Uh, so essentially younger trees and older trees have a higher chance of dying. Human interference at the moment is quite basic and so that it essentially via sliders you pick a range of a species um, that has a minimum uh, diameter of their maximum uh, and a max diameter of their maximum and it reduce maybe by a specific percentage each tick. Um, in terms of corroborating that, that's just specifically management, obviously no disease or anything or animal interaction or climate has been considered yet, um, but some kind of preliminary um, result is that play? Okay. So this is for the 
Met Office uh, data set uh, from the Oxford uh, weather station. Um, so this is a lower altitude. So in this context, we have Pine, uh, Alnus, or Alder, sorry, and Elm. Um, obviously, the species don't corroborate in actual what species will be in specific niches, but it's just the fact that the um, Alder and the Elm mirror each other in terms of what their optimal degree growing days are. And Pine obviously needs higher altitudes uh, in order to grow better. So here we have the bottom graph is how many trees are being recruited per tick of the sum of how many trees have been recruited uh, per tick. So we see that the pine is this bottom one here, less have been recruited, naturally because uh, the degree grown days doesn't fall into it because it's uh, lower altitude, higher temperatures. Um, and the fact that the elm is being reduced uh, by 10% within that specific range, after a while the uh, elm uh, plots start to actually drop. It's actually dropping now. It's very hard to see actually on that, but it's actually starting to drop below the uh, the number of pine in the simulation, even though there's been uh, there's less pine being recruited um, within the simulation space. And in in terms of corroborating that against uh, pollen records, the pollen records are essentially, I mean, what does a percentage pollen correlate to? Is it is it few trees, few large trees, or is it a lot of small trees essentially uh, within the simulation space? So it might not be a case of that less trees uh, means less trees of the same size, but it could be less trees of loads of small trees or a couple of large trees uh, is uh, indicated in the pollen records. And then similar again, um, the, the higher up uh, data set where more pine are grown in this context, but after uh, X amount of ticks, the, uh, the, the recruited pine uh, actually drops below the elm in this context, even though they're being reduced. So some interesting dynamics in the context of how do you infer from the actual pollen records of what the actual distribution or the actual age distribution of the species within the stand is, because there actually is no way of actually knowing that from the actual pollen records. So this probably adds even further to the debate of what the hell was happening uh, with the mid Holocene elm decline. But that's kind of just preliminary stuff at the moment. Uh, needs to run further uh, simulations and uh, corroborate this a bit more uh, and ask different stands but yeah that's kind of pretty much what I've been doing with the uh, mid holiday on kind so hopefully I can start get back to my uh, PhD research at some stage but yeah that's kind of pretty much it and yeah I flew through that and uh, there's our uh, collaborators and thank you very much.